Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be on using 3D models as a tool to help create 2D images inside Clip Studio Paint. The webinar will be presented by Jeremy Canton. Before we begin the webinar, we do have some housekeeping items that I'd like to share with everyone. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. The Q&A session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away, so please do that. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. Today's panelists are myself, Fahim Niaz, Joanna Brower from Celsius, and Jeremy Canton, your presenter. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready-to-publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. If you'd like to get some more information on our wonderful product, please check it out at clipstudio.net forward slash en or on graphicsly.com. And with that, we're glad to have a wonderful presentation with Jeremy, and we will be sharing the brains of the webinar with him right now so he can begin his presentation. Hey, everybody. All right, so hey guys, my name is Jeremy. I'm a 3D character artist in the gaming industry. Today I'm gonna to be using Clip Studio Paint and we'll be using a Cintiq 32 inch Cintiq Pro for this presentation. So today we're gonna to be talking about how to use 3D inside of Clip Studio Paint to make 2D images. And I realize that a lot of the people using Clip Studio Paint are probably 2D artists and that's completely cool. But I also realize that there may be some apprehension or fear towards the topic of 3D because you know it's this big scary thing and I've definitely been there. Um, but I'm here to tell you not to be afraid of it because I'm gonna introduce it really gently. And by the end of today, you're gonna to know how to do everything you need to start using Clip Studio Paint and 3D for your projects. So here's just a little intro image that I set up pretty quickly using 3D models. And before we get started, we really just need to talk a little bit for about 10 minutes on what exactly 3D is. So let's get started. So the way that I like to explain it is if you've ever played the game Battleship and you know, you've got a bunch of ships and you're trying to guess where your enemy is and so you're calling out B2, D3, those things and you're trying to say hit or miss, that would be a 2D coordinate system. So we have X and Y. So X would be going left and right and Y would be going up and down. So 3D is really just the addition of a third coordinate, and that would be the Z axis. So that would be going forward and back in space. So Battleship is a 2D system, and 3D is just adding a third coordinate to that. So you get depth, right? So before we had up, up and down, left and right, and now we have depth as well. So we'll be talking about how to do this, exactly what I'm doing right now inside Eclipse Studio Paint. So this is a 3D model, right? It's got thickness. And you probably don't realize, this is just an example, that 3D is really just three numbers, three numbers that make up a point in space, a coordinate. And you don't even realize that every day you're accessing this color wheel, right? But when you look at a color wheel, if you look at the sliders, you can go to RGB. RGB is just three numbers, hmm. So if I go to zero, black, all these are at zero. So you can actually represent color, believe it or not, in a 3D representation because you have enough data to make a point in space. So mathematicians, computer people, you can illustrate color in a 3D space like in this cube here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do a demonstration for you really quick. And this is just again to drive the point home about what 3D is. So let's say I have this color swatch here and I wanted to graph this out. So again this red would be X going left and right, green is going up and down, and our new one blue is going forward and back in space. So if I go here 
So I'll show you in a sec, but this color is this little blob right here, okay? Black would be zero, zero. So if you remember, oh, I hate to say this guys, but parabolas in math class, um, zero, zero is here. So that would be black. And then white would be a hundred for all, hundred percent on the corner for all of them. And you can see that it is in space because when I turn it around, it's like this. So again, what I'm doing is I'm just plotting colors on the color wheel in 3D space using RGB as my inputs for a, a point in space. And I'll just show you a few more colors. So if I had these other color swatches, I can turn those on. I'll just hide this to make it easier to see. And so you can see, you can actually map out any color on your color wheel in 3D space because it is just three numbers that make up a point, a coordinate. And again, that's what it looks like. So what is what is 3D made out of? Like, how do you how do you describe it? I like to call this the anatomy of 3D. So you have these little dots, and let me just maybe I'll make this easier. So these little dots, these little points, those points in space that I'm talking about, we call vertices. The edges, the lines in between, we call edges. So edges are what connect the vertices. And then if you have enough points in space and enough edges, let me just do this. We call this a face, right? So with that information, if you have enough of them, you can start describing forms. And these are called primitives. So these are the three most important shapes in 3D, cylinder, a cube, and a sphere, OK? So with this, 3D artists pretty much use, they usually start with these objects. Sometimes they use a plane as well. You can make anything in the world with these points, with enough points, OK? Um, we have a term, and then the, again, this is just terminology that I want to throw out there because I'll be saying these things down the road and just so we're all on the same page. On the left, we have what we call a low poly model, and on the right, we have a high poly model. And a poly, again, is just a face, so an area in between the edges. And basically, it's just a way to describe how many, how many faces do we have. So on the left, there's not that many, there's six. And on the right, there's something like a couple hundred, I don't know exactly, see? And you can tell the differences is really that one has a lot more resolution. It can describe a lot more form, a lot more subtly. So on the left-hand side, it's very jagged, right? So that would be kind of like your video game, maybe even your cell phone game kind of quality. And on the right, it's like cinematic 3D film resolution. It's just like really high quality stuff. You can get lots of detail. So I want to show you an example of high versus low poly. So I'm just going to switch over to a program called ZBrush. And today I'll be actually using a few programs outside of Clip Studio to kind of uh, work with the 3D stuff, but ultimately it'll all be in Clip Studio. And the programs I'll be using later and some of the stuff I'm showing you um, will all be free other than some of these programs I'm showing you right now. So this is one that is not free. This is a program called ZBrush. This is an example of a high resolution model. So we talked about points, right? Points in space. If you look at the upper right-hand corner, it says active points. That's how many points in space there are on this particular model right here. So right now, this is 605,000 points, okay? So just take a look. You can see the kind of detail that we can get out of 605,000 points. Let me just zoom out. It's a really cool model I got for free off of a site I'll show you in a minute. And if I turn on the wireframe, you can see what it's really made it up of. If we go in really close, oops, that's probably, let's go up here. Um, you can see that there's just all these little triangles, but they're, again, points in space and connected by edges. So this is a high resolution model, lots of detail. You can see it's a crab man, okay? But you can actually lower the resolution. I'm gonna just turn this off, okay. This is an example of the same character but a little bit less resolution. Let's take a look at the points, right? So before we had 605,000 points. On this model here, we have 41,000 points. Can you tell the difference? Right? It's still, the points are still roughly in the same spot. There's just not as many of them. And because there's not as many of them, we get less detail. Okay? And now I'm gonna take this to an extreme. So again, here's another one. So from left to right, you can see that we're losing resolution. We're getting a lot less resolution. And then finally, at the end, you can go really low, and we get a guy like this. And how many points does this guy have? This guy has 882 points. So that's like less than 
0.1% of what the original was. It's just very, very low, but still has the basic shape. It's not completely useless to us. You know, some games would still use resolution like that. Um, but I'm just trying to explain that that is what we call high resolution on the left, high poly, and then low poly on the right. Okay. And in general, you want it for Clip Studio Paint and a lot of programs, you want to try and actually keep it kind of low. You want to keep it low because um, this will really cause problems for your computer. And only really programs like ZBrush can handle the super high poly stuff. Most programs can only go, they can do it, but it'll cause you issues, right? So that's that. This information, all these points in space and all this stuff, all this 3D stuff I'm talking about, 3D anatomy, is all stored in different file types, okay? So we have three main file types we're gonna talk about today. And this is important because when you download your free assets on websites, you're gonna see this stuff. And so I want you to know what it means, okay? So on the left, we have an OBJ, and this is like basic 3D model. I'll show you in a sec. This is just a model um, without color. It's just the anatomy stuff I was talking about. There can be color, but it's not inside the OBJ file. It's inside the MTL file, okay? Which we'll talk about later. It's not really important. Just know that OBJ is just the model, so the form of a 3D model. The FBX, is a little bit more powerful. It's kind of beefier. You can fit entire scenes like a bedroom or a classroom, all that into one FBX file. Because the FBX file can store the model, the color, which you call texture, the materials, rig, bones, lights, and cameras. You don't need to worry about that. Just know that an FBX is a more powerful version of a 3D file. The other file that, um, and so sorry, these two are the most important, OBJ and FBX, because you'll see that everywhere and they're universal across multiple 3D applications, including Clip Studio Paint. You can import, let me just remove this. You can import OBJ and FBX, no problem, into Clip Studio Paint. You're also gonna find online one called STL, and this is really a file type used for 3D printing, because you know 3D printing printing is a big thing these days, and so a lot of websites offer this, but it's not usable in Clip Studio Paint as it is. So today I'm gonna show you how to use STL files inside of Clip Studio Paint, using a program called Blender. We're gonna convert it inside a program called Blender, okay? Free program. And then real quick, um, there are some other file types you're gonna see out there online, uh, but just know that it's not a big deal. You don't need to know this stuff. Just know that if you see these weird .lxo, .zt, all this stuff, if you see this online, don't worry. It just means that it's like a native file type to Maya, 3D Max, Cinema 4D, Blender, Moto, Lightwave, all these programs have their own file types. They open in those programs. And so in order to use it in Clip Studio Paint, you'd have to convert it. But don't worry about that. We'll just ignore those for today. We'll focus on OBJ and FBX. And then lastly, really, what are the advantages of using 3D inside of Clip Studio Paint? And I've kind of boiled it down to my four favorite. And really, 3D is just really good for duplication, so having tons of stuff. So if you want to do a thousand books, that's like one minute worth of work. It's really easy to duplicate a thousand books in 3D versus drawing that, it's a lot more difficult, right? You can iterate a lot and uh, we'll be showing examples of that later. And that just means that you can try different things. Like maybe I want the car on the left versus the right. You wanna turn things around. So you can make a lot of changes. Uh, complexity, I personally can't draw perspective super well. I'm sure it's not your strongest thing, some, some people, like drawing entire cities in one go. It's not super easy for me. So 3D is really good at that. It can just, it'll just do it. And again, leading to the next point, perspective. So in 3D, the perspective is done for you, which is kind of one of the greatest things in the world, all right? So really, I'm talking about 3D today, but just realize that it's just a tool. You don't have to use it if you don't feel that way, but it is there for you and it's great. Okay. Um, so now let's just do, I'm just gonna close this. I'm gonna show you how to start from scratch here. Okay. So this is how you import things. So we're just gonna go to file, import 3D data. This is what today is all about, so this button right here, okay? And I have a few things set up. Let's go with, this car. Okay, so when you open up a file, it just pops in, but a few things to take note of. You have a bunch of options here. 
up here at the top. You have a bunch of options down here that you might have seen before. And you have this kind of, you have a, a ruler and a grid set up over here and a little indicator is showing that this is a 3D layer, okay? Now, obviously this is really kind of big. So how do I make this kind of like, how do I push that back in space? So we're gonna talk about these options up here, these five, and we're gonna click on one of them. Notice how it gets a little bit darker. That means it's activated. So I don't, I don't have to click that down and use it, but I can click anywhere on the screen now and this effect will happen. So if I click, the car kind of moves around, okay? So this button on the right just moves things around in space. It's not going up or down. It's just going left and right, forward and back, okay? This next button here allows me to rotate, okay? Again, you don't have to be touching there. You can just click off and it'll still rotate because it's highlighted. Show you that. This thing allows you to rotate the car. This one is kind of like a free tumble, so you can kind of tumble around. Maybe your car is exploding and you need it to flip, right? And this one lets you go up and down, this, this uh, last option here. You can go up and down, that's what it's for. Now these options here are interesting. Let me just make it up straight again, okay? These last three here on the left allow you to control the camera. So you notice before we were actually moving the car. So we're in a 3D world right now. And before we're actually moving the car around. With these options, you're moving the camera. So even though it looks like the car is moving, it's actually not. It's in the same spot in 3D space. What we're moving is a camera. So this one, this option right here, lets you zoom in and out. This one lets you pan. So you can go over here, you can go over here. And this guy allows you to rotate, okay? If you middle mouse, or sorry, you click your middle mouse button down, you can also pan like that. It's a little bit more comfortable. So if I want to get a better shot of this car from say above, and I can use my mouse wheel to zoom in and out, this actually doesn't, so sorry, let me explain that better. This lets you zoom in and out, this option uh, right here, lets you zoom in and out. But if you use your mouse wheel, it actually changes the perspective. So you can get some cool like perspective distortion on your car. Oh, it's not working. Let me just go like that. Okay, so those are the options. You can use these to actually manipulate the 3D object, and you can use this to look around your scene. All right. Now, to, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that within your subtool, so if I let's say I click off, then I go to my move thing. Oh, like I can't, I can't really go back into 3D. How do I do that? You have to use the operation button here to access 3D objects. Nothing, nothing else will work. Uh, selecting won't work. Nothing else will work. You have to use this guy right here, okay? So within this option, the tool properties, you actually have all of these parameters that I showed you up here can also be controlled by these uh, slider bars down here at the bottom. So it's the same thing. You actually, if you click this little wrench down here, you actually have access to more options than are available here or here. So let's just see. Um, so sometimes rotate um, for you might actually be be disabled, but if you want to turn it on, you just go to this little wrench here, go to allocate, and then turn on the eye, and then suddenly, all of a sudden, you'll have rotate bars appear as well. So now I can rotate my car like, from this option. Okay, so just in case. The most important thing probably out of this submenu though, is if you click on this little, so we have our little car, we have our, sorry, eye, we have our car model here. If you click this drop down menu. This is gonna show you everything that's happening in the 3D scene of this layer. We're on a layer, but we're on a 3D scene right now. We have a camera. We actually have a light source, believe it or not. We have a grid and we have our object. So if I hit this, we can actually hide that car. And it's gonna be important because we can actually import multiple objects into the same layer. And so this is how we access those. So if I import another 3D model, let me just do that right now you'll see it show up on this list. So I'll just go to file, I'm gonna import something else. I downloaded a bunch of stuff and like we're just gonna pull things in for fun. So maybe we wanna have an F18 in our scene. And just give it a sec. Now I don't see it, so what does that mean? Where did it go? But I see something change. Chances are, because 3D models that you get online can come from anywhere, the scaling can be off. So, um, 
you have to scale down sometimes or sometimes you have to scale up. So again, looking at this drop down list, so I have my car, which I can hide temporarily, and now I've got this F18, so I wanna make sure I have it selected. And I'm gonna scale down. Oh, maybe I'm, am I starting to see something? Yeah, I am, but it's still too big, so maybe I have to zoom out. So I'm gonna zoom out. Maybe I'm gonna push it back in space. So I'm grabbing this uh, translate option, and I'm just gonna push it back in space. There we go, right? Gonna switch to this pan. I'm gonna move up a little bit. Oops. One sec. A little bit of a heavy model, so my computer is kind of chugging a little bit. Let me scale it down. We're gonna get there. There we go. Okay. So this is actually how I set up that intro uh, welcome screen is that I had a bunch of models in 3D space. Now, this is important. Because we imported a 3D model, we went to file, import 3D, onto the same layer as the car, this F18 and that car are actually sharing the same world. So they're actually, if I bring this guy back up, they're actually kind of in the same perspective, which is great. So if I can move this car around. So you can see that like, yeah, I could be like Tom Cruise trying to chase an F-18 as it's taking off. If you wanna do that for your, your comics, sure, like you can do that. Just make sure you import the next 3D model onto this layer, okay? If you were to, imp let's say I create a new layer, let me just show you, right? So if I import a new layer, or sorry, if I, if I create a new layer and I go to file import, and I, let's say, let's pick something easier. Let's do, let's do a vase. Just give it a sec. If your screen went black, that's normal. Just give it a sec. Okay. So you'll notice that this vase is not part of the same perspective. It's doing its own thing completely. And you can actually show that, see this little crossed out part? If you right click it, you can hit show ruler. And if I show ruler on the vase, this is the vanishing point, this is the horizon, this is the grid. And if I show ruler on the one below, it's in a different, oops, there's a different perspective grid going on. So these objects are not on the same level. So again, my main point is just, if you want your same your objects to be part of the same 3D space, you have to import it onto the same la layer as your other 3D objects, okay? So that's the basics of that. That's just uh, manipulating. Oh, actually, I should talk about these things down here. Um, basically, these options are for characters. Uh, you can deal with materials here, bones. You can, uh, there's some preset poses that you can use. You can reset the initial pose. So um, this one will set it back to its initial pose. This will reset the scale. So if I did scaling like on the jet, this will set it back to what it was when I imported it, that massive jet and this will reset the rotation. This is probably the most useful button on this entire part. This zooms in and it focuses on the asset I have selected. So if I have my car selector right now and I hit this button, it focuses the camera on that guy, okay? So that's probably the most useful thing. This one puts the model onto the ground and this is a bunch of presets, which is, is it has a character on it, but it can really be used for anything. They're just orthographic views. So if I want front, side, all that stuff. Now. Part of the reason why, again, I didn't want to mention is just that it depends how the 3D model was set up, you'll get different results. So these aren't entirely useful sometimes, so I kind of just ignore that. And this button here just brings up the sub options that we were looking at before, okay? So that's everything you need to know about how to manipulate 3D objects, okay, inside Eclipse Studio Paint. You use these buttons here, make sure you click to highlight them, and then they can stick, and then you can just click and drag anywhere to manipulate it. All right, so let's talk about how you convert this stuff into 2D to use it for like images or illustrations or something. So I'm gonna close this. And let's just create a new one. I'm gonna file import 3D data. Actually, I'm gonna open. Now, I wanted to show you this. So this is a 3D model, simple 3D model like we saw before. I'm gonna use the little option button here, operation button, and I'm gonna move it around. 
And you'll notice that the camera is tilted in this one. So if you look at these options down here on the right, if you select the camera, we have a bunch of settings for the camera itself. And if I show the grid, it might be easier for you to see. Or not. Okay, anyway, there's this roll feature right here. And that lets you, so by default, it's at zero. So the, the horizon line is completely straight. And if you use the roll, you can actually like tilt. Okay, so that's just one little thing I forgot to mention. Now, this is the cool part. So let's say I have a stack of books, right? And I want to convert this into not a 3D object, but a 2D with halftone and, you know, standard rasterized properties. What you do is you go to layer, LT conversion of layer. This is the magic button, almost as important as importing the 3D model to begin with. So LT conversion of layer. And we're going to talk about these options here. Let me just show you what it does. Okay, so we're going to hit preview and I hit OK. So when I do that, it takes that 3D model and it converts it into a 2D layer with half tone, shadow, light, all that stuff. Okay, so let's look at the different options for that. I'm gonna turn this around. Oops. Just get a different view. Okay, so again, to do this, we just go to layer, LT conversion of layer. And here you can choose whether you want it to be raster or vector. And we're gonna hit preview so we can see what it's gonna do. This adjusts the line width. So the thickness of the lines, obviously you don't want to go too thick because then you start to get blobby, you start losing definition. Usually I keep this around one. Oh, whoops, didn't mean to do that. LT conversion of layer. So accuracy detection kind of just adds more line work depending on different things. It, it can get a little messy. So usually you want to keep this kind of low, but you start losing definition. So for example, this corner edge of the, the book there's no longer a line there. What if I did want a line? Then I just bump this up and it starts detecting the normals of the 3D model. We didn't talk about that, but basically it starts giving you more line work, okay? This button you can kind of experiment with. Sometimes it gives you different results, but sometimes I leave it on. Maybe I want that line to show up. So just try it out. Depth is pretty simple. It just means that the closer you are to the camera, the more line work will show and the further away, the less line work. So if you want this option, maybe that's a stylistic choice. You can have more line work and then have it drop off in the distance so that it's not as prominent, doesn't pop up in the foreground. But I usually turn this off as well. Smoothing is just kind of what it implies. It just smooths out the line work a little bit. Um, experiment with that on your own. Extract line, just ignore this part for now because this is gonna add um, kind of some mess, messy line work to your, to your work. And this is kind of the most important section right here is the, to the uh, tone work section. So here you can kind of adjust how many tones are going to, how many tone values are going to show up. So if you want to add more, you just bring your mouse in between two and it'll divide it exactly in half. Okay. So if I just wanted a high contrast image, you can just use one tone, but chances are you want about three or maybe four. Okay. And these settings here allow you to choose what the halftone is made out of. So you can have the dots, you can have squares, you can have all kinds of stuff. But these settings are actually parameters you can change later. So it's non-destructive. So don't worry about it too much. Let's just do it. And then you can always change these particular settings in this area later. So I'm just gonna hit okay. So now you can see what happened. It creates a folder. So I'm gonna hide and show. This is the folder, I'll just label it with red so you can see creates a folder filled with lots of layers. Let's go through them one by one so you understand what happened. So let's just hide all of it and go through. The first thing it creates is a line, line level. So it looked at that 3D model and it generated that, th that 2D line work. Then it went through the darks, the mid values, higher and lighter. And then finally it has like a kind of an alpha shape, a base shape. So if I select this, okay. So it created all of these things inside this folder. Now, this is what I meant by you can change the settings later. So let's just pick one. Let's just hide all of this and go with this one. So if I zoom in closely and you'll see under the layer properties, we're under tone, under number frequency, okay? Basically that adjusts, the way I think about it, it's kind of like it's zooming in and out of the half tone pattern. Let me just change this pattern to something simpler. So circles, okay? So here we got some circles, halftone. So frequency, all it does is 
if I have it low, it's the we're really kind of zoomed in to the halftone pattern. If I pull it out, it's like we're zooming out of the halftone pattern. And density, the other option you can use to control this, is literally the size of each of those dots, like the diameter. So if I shrink this, they're really small dots. And if I make them bigger, they're really big dots. Okay. So those are really the two most important settings, and you can change the halftone pattern itself. So if I don't, let's say I don't want halftone pattern, I just want it to be solid, easy. You just click this button, turn off halftone, and then you have a solid color, okay? So let's say I wanted my shadows to be like a dark blue or something. I can switch this to layer color, so we got that, and I'll just add a sub color. And now, instead of a halftone, I actually just have a solid band of color. You can start digital painting this stuff, all your normal things. So we've converted a 3D model into an asset we can use just like part of our drawing. Nobody could really tell unless it's like, I don't know, you just couldn't really tell, right? This is where you start bridging the gap between 3D and 2D work. Now, let me show you a trick that I love. I don't know how much you guys use actions, but I use this quite a bit. So we're gonna set up an action. And if you don't see this window, you just go to window and auto action is somewhere, where is it? Uh, right here, auto action, okay? So if you don't see this window, that's where it is right now. So if I set new action, and I'm gonna call this, actually, I'll just leave it for now, action three. I hit record, okay? We're gonna hide this layer. Oops, actually, yeah, I, should, I should start over, start over, start over. So new action, gonna hit record. We're ha we have our 3D layer selected. We're gonna go to layer, LT conversion of layer. Gonna do exactly what we did before. Sure, I like these settings, they're perfect, okay? I hit okay. Goes through and it does the LT convert, I hit stop. And what that did right now, is it made a button so that I can quickly convert 3D models into 2D line work. So let's say I hit play, let's, let's move this thing, let's stop looking at this boring thing here. So let's, uh, let's move this guy a little bit, let's rotate it, and let's just hit play and see what happens. All right, so we got that. Now let's say I want some more books over here, and I rotate those, and actually I make them big because they're science books and they're bigger. And then I hit play, right? And then I want more books. I want a whole library of books. I want a thousand books. That's easy. That's no problem. You don't have to spend all day long drawing them. You just keep duplicating this. And let's get, let's start thinking about composition here. Okay, let's hide that behind. Let's hit play again. So you can see how quickly you can start developing. This is where the power of 3D comes in, right? You can see how quickly you can start filling a space with 3D objects that kind of look like 2D work, right? So using an action, and I'm just gonna rename this so it's easier to see. I'm gonna call this convert to convert 3D to line work. That's my magic button for using 3D button, 3D models. All right, so that's that's really cool. Um, so yeah, that's the main thing. Now I just I wanted to mention that, yeah, you can definitely tell when something is 3D, right? But nobody said that you had to use this exactly as it is. You can use 3D models to be a reference for you. You can go ahead and trace over this stuff if you want and just use it as a reference because definitely one of the problems with 3D is that it looks technical, it looks straight edge. And so you want things to be a little bit more organic, have that ink paper feel or just you know something a little bit with more life in it. So there's nothing stopping you from just using the 3D as a reference, blocking things out and then drawing on top to get some cooler stuff. So that's the gist of it. We went through the entire workflow and now I'm gonna do a little, a little bit of a fun demonstration scene here. Um, so let's start something new. All right, so, oh, actually, um, we should start talking about some sites that you can get models. So, so first of all, so right here on the, the right here, um, if we go to the material browser, this is just, I just expanded that open, and you go down to the 3D section here, you can go to search for materials on, uh, on Asset Store. So we can just click that, and this window will pop up. So Clip Studio Paint has this ready to go. And so there's a bunch of 3D assets. And if you want to look for free ones, uh, you can just go to detail and filter price by free. So we'll just do that just to make it so that anybody can follow this if they want. So there's a bunch of stuff in here. Let's get this table. So let's just click that. And let's just download it. Okay, it says it's been downloaded. OK, 
Okay, I think maybe it was done. Anyway, that's how you do it. I'm gonna use, if just because I have to close, in order, if you don't see it show up in your, your section, you have to actually close Clip Studio Paint and open it again, and it'll show up in your download folder right here. Okay, but because I don't wanna close Clip Studio Paint at the moment, we'll just look through some of the stuff I already have, but that's how you do it, is you just browse the asset store, and then it'll show up right here in your download folder. So here's some objects, and all you do to send it in three, into your scene, you just click and drag it, and there we go. Same thing that we were doing with the imported models that I showed you before. Okay, so there's that, and you can download all kinds of cool stuff. I'm gonna, how about this park bench? So we just drag it in the scene again. And one of the cool things about using the asset store inside of Clip Studio Paint is that you just click and drag onto the same layer and it'll fit into the 3D space um, like we did before when we had this icon selected. Basically what I'm saying is that it'll, everything will fit together unless you create a new layer, then it'll be in its own perspective. So let me just shrink the scale of this object down a little bit. Sorry, my UI is a little bit cluttered. Hey, look, we have a bench, right? And let me just let me just pull in something else. Let me pull in this basket here. It's a really cool asset, and I'll tell you why. It's got something special on it. So this is like a grocery basket. Again, I'm just gonna go down here and change the scale a little bit because it's a little bit big. Now, objects can actually be rigged and sometimes objects from the asset store will be like this. Um, you can click on this handle, for example. Oops. And down here at the bottom, this bones option, we didn't talk about this, but if you click this, you'll notice there's a slider because this asset has this set up. When I slide this thing, it's got a preset motion, preset animation of where the handle can go, which is kind of cool, right? Because not, not all baskets will be like this. Sometimes you want it lower. So some assets have this feature. So if you want to check, check this button here and you might see some some movement like that. Okay, so that's the asset store. So real quick, I want to mention a few websites where you can download some free 3D models. So one of my favorites is free3d.com. You go to this website here. It's got a bunch of stuff. You can go to free 3D models here, and these ones are all ones you don't have to pay for. All right, so lots of cool stuff. City buildings, you can search for anything you want, you will find stuff. Another one is my mini factory right here. It's got a lot of stuff used for 3D printing. This is where you're gonna see the STL files show up. Another one is called Thingiverse. They have a lot of cool stuff that you can check out. Let's just see what this is. All of this stuff you can be used in Clip Studio Paint if you find an OBJ, an FBX, or an STL. Now, I'm looking at the clock already and we're going a lot faster than I expected, but I wanna show you really quick um, how to use Blender to convert STL files. So I'm just gonna go to my desktop here and open up Blender. This is a free 3D program. So this is how I would recommend if you're new to 3D, you wanna kind of mess around with it, try out Blender. It's free and it's got a lot of power. I'm just gonna select this cube and delete it. And let's just grab a, uh, an STL file. So I actually found one earlier. I thought it was pretty cool. It's called Cute Vader. And if we download it, look at it right here where it says file format, it says STL, so that's what we're gonna try. You can't open this in any other program other than Blender, as far as I can tell right now, that's free. So I'm just gonna open this folder up here and you're gonna have to unzip it. Inside this folder, you'll find an STL file, okay? So I'm just gonna go to Blender and this is just a really quick intro on how to do that. Let's go to File, Import, STL. And don't mind my messy st stuff here, but find your file, you'll find the STL, you're gonna import it. Okay. And where is he? Oh my God, okay. So I'm just hitting the S key, I'm gonna scale him down a little bit. This isn't, this isn't a blender webinar, unfortunately, but basically experiment with it and you'll be able to check out some of these options. So I'm just gonna rotate it, whoops. 
That is not what I meant to do. So I'm going to rotate him to be upright so he looks a little bit better. Kind of just want to center him a little bit. And then what you do, so this is an STL file. You go to File, Export, and OBJ. And I'll just save it somewhere. I'll call it Cubator and Export. So it's going to take a second because it's a, it's a big file. And now when I go back to Clip Studio Paint, I'm just going to close these real quick. Oops, new document, import 3D data, and Cubator's here. Now, it's going to be kind of big, and I'm realizing that we're kind of low on time. But basically, that's how you do it. It's you'd import this, and Cubed Vader would then be inside of Clip Studio Paint. Okay, but I want to show you kind of a, a quick way to do a scene instead. So I'm going to go to File, Import. We're going to import some assets, and I want to import not you, you guys. So this is again another 3D model that I got off of Free3D.com. Just a soldier. So I'm going to use these. I'm going to position him in space. I'm going to use a little handy button here. This is just a demonstration on how we make a, a scene using 3D models pretty quick. So I'm going to hit my little line work button. Okay, that's pretty good. I want him to have a buddy. Maybe this is like a squad of soldiers looking for alien life on an alien planet. I'm just going to move him around. Uh, I like, I'm kind of obsessed with this composition where you have two figures next to each other, and then you put a third one far off to kind of offset it. So let's move this guy over here. Da, da, da. There we go. I'm going to click on this soldier layer again, and I'm going to import a new model. And I want to import this because, sorry, this is going to, this might go black for one sec, but it's worth it. Just uh, hang on one sec. It's just going to give it a second to load. I want to show you that you can repurpose 3D models for something completely different than they were intended. Okay, so it's black. Where's the model? I don't know. Chances are it's too big, so I'm going to go to Object Scale. I'm going to turn it down. And look at that. It's a vase with a plant. Now, I don't want the whole vase because what kind of alien planet would be like that? So I want to delete this thing. So in this case, I actually can do that. If you see these blue highlighted things, it means the model's separated. And you can actually control those separately. So if I go to this list, I hit this drop down arrow, right? I will see a pot thing here. And I'm going to hide that. I'm going to hide some of this. Actually, I'll, yeah, I'll leave that. Okay. So now it's just a plant. So it was a vase, but hey, now it's an alien plant on an alien planet. How cool is that? So now I'm going to drag this down. And it's like we've got vegetation there in the jungle, OK? All right, something like that. And I'm just going to hit my Convert to Line Work button. Cool. All right, and let's give this just a quick, quick gradient. Let's give this. A night sky, kind of outer space thing. Okay, I'm just going to create a new layer. I'm going to do some stars on this thing. I'm going to hide this. And we are going to use this cool brush to make stars. I'm going to break it up with a little bit of, oops, that's not right. It's too scaled up. Okay, so you can kind of see how this can evolve quickly, right? So let's just do one more thing. These guys need a, these need, guys need to have come from somewhere. So I'm going to go import 3D data, let's do a warship. Again, this is another free model you can just access somewhere. And again, I'm not saying that this is like the pinnacle of art or anything. I'm just saying that you can use this as a jump point to block in your scenes. There's nothing stopping you from drawing with or on top of this. Okay, I'm just going to scale this guy down. A little bit dense. I'm just going to bring him up. This is a spaceship, guys. Too big, too big, too big. All right, I'm going to convert this guy.
There we go. Okay, now you don't have to use half tone, right? You can totally use solid colors instead if you prefer that. Now, I have a few more minutes, so I'm going to show you that splash image that you guys saw earlier. So this is a scene that I kind of, this is when I first discovered this whole technique and all that. Uh, I'll just show you really quick. Uh, what am I doing? I am going to, here, just give this a second to load. You might have seen this on the, uh, the splash work. So I'm going to show you. So this is the 3D scene that I made for that image that I created. And I'm going to show you the uh, the same thing inside of Clip Studio Paint. So let's just close this. Oops. Let's go to this. Let's give it a second. It's a big one. Maybe I can slip over here. And so really what I wanted to show you is that, yeah, I modeled all this. And I'll show you the reference. So reference is really important, guys. You need to um, look at real life for inspiration. You don't have to copy it necessarily. I'm just going to go full screen real quick so you can see my references for this image. I was just wanted to do some kind of buggy. So I was looking at, really, I wanted this idea of the exposed steering and exposed brakes and everything. That's, that was super cool to me. So I did a lot of research, looked at a lot of um, cars, buggies, dune buggies in particular, tanks. You can tell I was kind of inspired by this, this hangar Air Force hangar, lots of different stuff. And reference is really important. And this is kind of what I ended up with. It's not as detailed as those things, obviously, because I just wanted to simplify. But if you kind of look at this long enough, you'll notice that I actually, um, I won't say stole, but I was inspired or referenced a lot of stuff that exists in real life. And that actually just helps you learn about all kinds of things, design, why is it like that? It must be like that for a reason. So everything, the amps, the radios, this is all my reference for this image. Even the food, just take a look, see what you can peel from it. And this is one of the most important things too, is I was trying to do somebody that was kind of in the zone. So I was looking at, this is uh, Gabriella and Rodrigo. And uh, you know, what does it look like when somebody is just in the zone, lost in the music? It's, is, it, is it just with their eyes closed? No, it's something else, right? You can just feel it. So just look at reference, you never know what you can find. And um, again, I was definitely inspired by the work of uh, Machai uh, Kuchiara awesome work uses that half tone pattern and stuff a lot kind of looks like clip studio paint stuff um, this was my initial test they made a 3d object converted it to 2d lines this is the final image how it turned out in the end as well so you've kind of seen how we do a lot of this stuff today and just some close-ups okay so that that's that's the reference this is the scene itself And again, I'm showing you those four qualities that I, I mentioned in the beginning. Duplication, right? Lots of duplication here, these robots. Let me show you really quick. I did a lot of iteration as well. I was like, hmm, maybe I want a robot walking up front here, holding a canister. Maybe that's too much compositionally. Maybe I want him looking there. Maybe, I'm, maybe I don't want this guy at all. You can, you can play with all this stuff. Maybe I want a second vehicle, right? So... All of these things, perspective, iteration, duplication. Um, let's say your client, you're doing some client work and they're like, you know what? We love this. This is perfect. This is so perfect. But can you rotate the uh, the car like 20 degrees to the left? That would be what we want. You know, that's, that's what we're paying you for. And so if you drew that by hand, that would be a lot of work, right? To reposition this. But with the use of 3D, because you mold it once, you just, that's a quick 20 second fix and it's done. Um, the line work that I got from this 3D model was pretty rough and I, I actually didn't clean it up, but you can definitely go around it if you wanted to and get perfectly laser clean line work. That was not my choice for this piece, but there's nothing stopping you from just using 3D as a tool. So that's pretty much um, what I can cover, I think, in this time. I'm ready to go for another hour, but I, I understand this is a 45 minute presentation. So uh, yeah, is that, uh, is that good, guys? Am I... Actually, um, let me just open this real quick. I guess that's uh, the end. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. I believe uh, that was a fantastic uh, webinar. Um, I'm sure uh, Joanna has a ton of uh, questions to ask you, so we'll let okay. her uh, jump in and uh, ask away. 
Cool. Yes. All right, we have a lot of questions. Um, a lot of them have to do with uh, setting up the models in uh, Clip Studio Paint, especially regarding lighting. Do you, oh, can yeah, you explain about... how, how to um, change the lighting on the 3D models in Clip Studio Paint? Sure, 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 sure. Um, let, me, let me just uh, real quick import 3D data. Let me pull something cool. Let's get a let's get a helicopter. All right. So sorry, how to set up the lighting, right? Is what you said? Yes, exactly. So you bring in a 3D model and you can see it has a shadow on the ground. But let's say I didn't let's say this thing was flying in the air. How why would there be a shadow like right beside it? So you have full control over the lighting right here. You might have noticed already. Um, scroll down in these options. Again, this is part of this white tool here. You have the option to apply a light source. So you can see lights being affected on it. You have the ability to turn off or on the shadow. So if I was flying through the sky, that was, that's what I would want to do is I wouldn't want this shadow to be there. So you can just turn that off completely. You can have the, uh, the lighting like that. And now you can also, if you click and drag anywhere on the sphere, you can have full control over the lighting as well. So if I want it to be underlit, I can do that. Just keep keep dragging around the sphere, and that's how you control the lighting on a 3D object. Okay. Yeah, um, yep. Can you tell us a bit more about the camera connection between like an object in Blender and an object in a Clip Studio Paint? Do you have to do a special setup for that so that they match roughly? Sorry, the uh, the camera. Yeah, like you have the camera view in Clip Studio Paint, but you also have the camera view in a Blender. Does the setting in Blender, for example, uh, affect the cameras in Clip Studio? That's a good question. No, it doesn't. Um, so right now we're looking at that grid, the X, Y, Z grid that I told you in the beginning. So left and right, X, all that. And so because I positioned this guy um, at zero, zero, so zero, zero is where everything merges, right? Because I put him at zero, zero, um, he'll be there. He just might be a little bit big. So I don't know. Nobody knows really exactly where the camera would be. in. So the camera in Clip Studio Paint, I don't know where it would be in this Blender scene right now. I don't know where it would be. You kind of just have to play with it. It would be something, it would probably be positioned like this right now. It would be something like that. So the camera, it won't be the same. It will not be the same. Um, but you can, uh, can kind of just figure it out as long as your object is on zero zero and then you can you should be able to find it because everything goes back to zero zero so i think it's possible you could import cameras with an fbx file i haven't tried it myself so yeah so that's that's all i can say about that okay um very um basic questions because it's a bit hard to see as can you explain the scaling and the camera movement in clip studio paint again sure uh the scaling so let's say i have this same helicopter um, and again, this is just another option inside of this tool. This is at the top. The first one actually is object scale. So if I wanted to scale this object down, let me see if I can show, I don't know why the rulers aren't showing up. There you go. Um, oh, it's going away. Okay. This is how you control the scale is that you just use the object scale like this. So you just use the scale slider. Sorry. Was there another part to that question? Uh, no, just uh, the camera movement because the the mouse, like what you do, is not really vis visible. So uh, do you just drag your mouse when you? Okay. Yeah. So again, so these options on the the five here control the actual 3D object itself. But if you want to control the camera, it's the one with these little camera icons. So you can click click one. See how it's darker blue? It's it's kind of subtle. See how it's darker blue? That means I'm fixed on that. Anything I click anywhere I click on my screen will only affect tumbling right now. If I click on this one and I click anywhere, anywhere on the screen, then it'll do panning. And then if I click this one and I click on anywhere on my screen, I can zoom in and out. So it really depends which one you have selected here. If you have none of them selected, so let's say I click off and I click like this, it'll still kind of, st it'll always be on one of these options, I think. And so you just want to make sure you're clicked on the right one. It doesn't matter where you click, as long as you have the right property selected, then you can do anything you want like this. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, just just a second. Sure. Um, so wanna... you've used the, the the function for importing uh, 3D models through the the file um, menu. Yeah. Uh, do you have like a do you 
could you show what happens if you just drag a model in from the material palette? Uh, sure. Yeah. So we actually um, we did that, but I'll do it again. So if you if if you download something from the materials here, and let's pick some. Let's, this I love this thing. So I'm mean, gonna take a, this is a 3D object, and I know because it says down here 3D item. I just click and drag onto my scene, and it immediately sets up a 3D space. So I'll show this. It sets up a 3D world for me, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna move it back away. I'm gonna move my camera out really quick, and I'm just gonna rotate it. And that's, it's as simple as that. You just download assets from, you can, again, to find 3D assets, just click on 3D, hit search, and you can find all kinds of stuff right here in your browser. Okay, so like this helmet, actually that's pretty cool. Just download that, right? And then you just click and drag it into your scene. That's it. Okay, wonderful. Um, you ex explained the, um importing objects and preparing them for paint. Do you have any uh, experience with how the rigging works for Clip Studio Paint? Ah, do we have time? Because I wanted to show that. Um, <laughs> yeah. A little bit. OK, OK, OK. Let's uh, let's do this real quick, guys. Uh, let me just close this. I got to close some stuff because my computer is getting a little slow. One second, guys. Just one sec, one sec, one sec. OK, OK, OK. I did want to show this, actually. I was worried about time. So let's say I import a model, like uh, a character. All right, so you guys might recognize this character here. Just give it one sec, right? So this is a 3D model of some dude. And if I rotate him, right, like that's pretty cool, but like I don't like the position his arms are in. That's kind of, I don't know how, I don't know how useful this is to me, even though it looks really cool because his arms are like that. Well. What you can do is um, you can use a site called Mixamo. I have this set up here. And what it does is it allows you, this is a character I modeled for work. They let me show it here. Um, what it allows you to do is upload a character and then it's rigged for you automatically. So I'll just show you really quick. So what you do is you upload something and then you can apply any of these animations to it and it'll start animating or not, okay? So you can start seeing it move. So if you want to do this, you go to the site mixmo.com. It's completely free. You just need an account. Just go to upload. So I'm just going to select a character. And we are going to go to, oh boy, where did I put it? Uh, Mixmo. Okay. So you're going to upload Iron Man clean. This is going to take a second, but I'll just show you. I'll just show you while it's loading. So what it does is I'm going to delete this. Once it's done uploading, I'll show you how to do this. But what it allows you to do now, so it's the exact same thing as I had before, except look at this. Now, oops, that's not what I meant. Now you can rotate individual parts, which is a lot more useful to me in terms of getting some cool posing or something. So it's about going to that site and just uploading a character and then it's rigged, okay? So you can get a lot more cool stuff like that. Uh, let's, okay, no, it's still going. Okay, so once you've uploaded your model, you just follow these steps, it's really simple. It's gonna say, where's the chin? There's the chin. Where's the wrist? There's the wrist. Elbows, something like that. Knees, something like that. Groin, something like that. That's all you need to do, simple, hit next. It's gonna load, it's gonna take a few minutes, so I'm gonna tap back. And in the end, what you're gonna get is a file that lets you animate characters like this. Sorry, not animate them, but move them around. So these are rigged characters. And this is the way I recommend to take any character you want and give it the ability to control it. Okay. Now, there's also, there's always the, uh, the Clip Studio Paint models that you guys can use. And these are better. These are even better because they're rigged, what we call, sorry, I'm just going to, Actually, I can't really show this. These are better because they have inverse kinematics, which means if I move this guy's wrist on this model here, sorry, this is not great, okay. If I move his wrist, his entire arm will, will automatically animate and follow by default. If I move his ankle, his entire leg will follow. If I do the same thing on, the, on this, uh, this Iron Man character, it doesn't do that because it's not as sophisticated as the defaults, but it still allows me to, I'm sorry, I'm having, one sec. 
There we go. It still allows me to animate it, but it's not nearly as sophisticated. So if I pick his hand, I don't think his whole arm is going to move with it. Well, I guess it will, but it won't do it. As, see, see how it's moving the entire body as opposed, uh, as opposed to just moving the elbow? So this is not as sophisticated as the uh, Clip Studio Paint one. So does that answer your question? So if I go back here, he's still rigging. It'll take a few minutes, but that's that's the gist yeah. of how you do it. Yeah, I think I think that's great. Thank you very right. much. Cool. Um, do you have like a preferred size for a document uh, made in Clip Studio Paint when you want to import models? Does it depend on how big the model is, or is it just like your standard illustration size? Uh, how big is the actual Clip Studio file? Uh, no, I mean just the, the document, like in in terms of size, like a DPI. Oh, uh, oh. Um, do I have a personal preference? Right now, yeah. I've been working at about um, 300 reds, so about everything has been about three or four k right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but I usually work about six k. My um, <laughs> this big one here. Let's just let's just see. Uh, Im change image resolution. Yeah, this is six six point five k. Six. It's pretty huge. The reason, real quick, the reason why I did that was because when you're using halftone, you want to be able to see these individual dots. If your resolution is too small with halftone, it becomes this blobby gray mess, and that's not good. You want to be able to see actual individual uh, dots. So that that's my reason, yeah. Okay, and uh, one last question regarding the ideal setup, essentially. Um, how strong does or how good does your graphics card have to be to make a scene like this? Uh, that's a good question. So this scene that I made, um, this particular one, I'll just show you really quick. Uh, this scene here, I did it on a 980 Ti. So that's a that's about I think that card came out in 2015. So not I don't think it needs to be too bad, but obviously a better graphics card always helps. Um, right now I'm on a 2080 Ti, so it's it's pretty beefy. It can handle pretty much anything, um, but you don't need that to make this. So again, I made this back. I made this last year. It was a 980 Ti. Um, so yeah, I'd say something something about that level at least. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. Um, and we did get the the question once again. What's what's your uh, workspace setup in terms of tablets? Uh, right now I'm using a Wacom Cintiq Pro 32 inch. That's all, right. all I'm doing right now. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. That's Thanks, all guys. for the question. All right, cool. All right, Jeremy, thank you so much for your presentation. It was wonderful. We learned a lot. Cool. Yes, and I'm sure there's a lot more to learn as well. So hopefully <laughs> uh, we can continue on in the future with some more 3D sure. to 2D stuff. Yeah. Thank you for your time again, and thank you to the audience for their time, for sitting in and uh, watching uh, Jeremy do his thing. So uh, thank you to everybody. If you'd like more information on Clip Studio Paint, please make sure to visit us at clipstudio.net forward slash en, as well as on graphicsly.com. This webinar will be recorded and will be posted on our YouTube sites. There will be two of them, two videos and two different links that you guys can check out. Um, you can go check out our channel at Celsius Web, as well as at Graphicsly. And for more information on Jeremy and just what he's up to, if you'd like to follow up with him with some questions or just to see what he's doing and check out his posts on social media, uh, we've listed all of his handles there. So please make sure to follow up with him and follow him as well. And with that, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you.